Hey everybody, it is Kat Neville with Tastemakers and I have a treat for you today because we are speaking with none other than Doug Frost who is the Kansas City based American master of wine and master sommelier and also a gentleman who I have known for years and who I think is just a pretty awesome human, um, along with being one of the foremost wine experts in the country and also on, on the planet. Um, and you, Doug, you have um, some pretty exciting news, which is why we're, we're chatting today, because you are actually launching a brand new sommelier organization called the Best USA Sommelier Association, right? Exactly that. Yeah. Thank you, Kat, for your kind words. Um, certainly, um, there have been chapters of the ASI, as it's called. It's a it's a uh, international organization called the Association of International Sommeliers, and there have has been previously an American chapter of that group, but it's been moribund for some time. So it was time for the U.S. to to participate again because essentially this is the international competition for all sommeliers worldwide. They get together once every two or three years and they all uh, compete against each other to see who will be crowned the, the best sommelier on the planet. And the US has, has basically sat aside for, for many years. Um, it, it off and on has tried to participate, but we're trying to, we're creating this organization so that the US has a support system for those candidates, those sommeliers who want to try and compete at the highest level that they will be able to uh, prepare and compete here compete in the Western Hemisphere against the rest of the Americas, as it's called, and then finally compete uh, in the global competition. So let's kind of zoom out a little bit. I'm a little bit fuzzy, and I think probably some other people are as well. How is getting, becoming a certified sommelier where there are different levels, different from these types of competitions? Are they intertwined? Are they separate? How is it different? Yes, they're certainly very separate. Uh, as someone who's been a master sommelier for three decades uh, at this uh, at this point, a little frightening to think about it, but nonetheless, um, the Court of Master Sommeliers is an examining body that examines uh, and certifies sommeliers at the certified level, um, the advanced level, and certainly then finally the, the master sommelier level, which is something that I completed a long time ago and which now, you know, 300 or so humans around the planet have, have uh, completed. But those are exams. And this instead is a competition in which master sommeliers from around the globe or sommeliers, um, whether or not they have been certified by the Court of Master Sommeliers, they're all competing at the highest level against each other to see who will be crowned, uh, as mm -hmm. I say, every three years, typically. So I think that the someone who's not a wine nerd, um, you know, kind of knows a little bit about these competitions, um, just from like the films that have come out and just in and all of the kind of hoopla surrounding it. Um, what, so when someone is competing, you know, what, what are you actually testing them on and how do you test them? Well, there, there are many different uh, layers to, to a, a good competition. Um, certainly one of the, the you know, most uh, straightforward uh, layers of all is simply information that you'll be asked to uh, explain. I mean, just this afternoon, someone said, what is this? And sent me a, a copy of a label uh, that said Rochamoine. And I, it was fun to be able to say, oh, Rochamoin, I have some of those in the basement. It's my favorite Sauvignon, at least one of them, uh, i.e. in a competition setting, someone could say, please bring me a Rochamoin, what, what vintage would you recommend? And you would the, then therefore need to be able to say, oh, well, it's, it, it basically means you know, the, 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 the uh, sheep's rock, if you will. And it's a special place in this vineyard called Sauvignon. It's 100% Chenin Blanc, but often because of the, the, uh, the flinty soils, it can be rather um, steely and rather uh, unusual. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a dry white wine that's very earthy and very minerally. And, and I would recommend, in fact, buying the wine that's 10 years old rather than one that's young. And, and these sorts of questions are gonna be thrown at you throughout a competition to explain what a wine is, where it comes from, what to expect, and most importantly, how to use it. What should I, if I'm going to have a Rosham one, what should I be, you know, consuming with it? And and that can happen in, you know, in in for virtually any wine made anywhere in the world. So that's the sort of theory side of it. But then there's the sales side of it, in which 
I need to be able to explain to a, a, a customer why it would be fun to have that wine, what makes that wine so different and alluring, and, and really, in fact, sell that wine in such a way that it's exciting to, to the people sitting at the table that it sounds like I should have that. that. I've never had an experience like that before. Please, let's do that. Um, and, and, and so you would be judged on your ability to sell, but also on your ability to read the customer. Because one of the things that happens in a competition setting is all customers are not alike. So you need to decide, you know, some customers want a lot of information, some want to be sold, some already know what they want. And, and you as a server ought to be very um, adept at reading your customer and, and responding in, in a manner that seems appropriate. I still remember years ago going to De Georges Sank in in, uh, in Paris and meeting a very young sommelier there. Uh, I've stayed in contact with him actually over the years because I was, I was completely amazed by his ability. He came to our table, it was six Americans. We're a bunch of knuckleheads. We're having a great time. We're joking around. We're having a, you know, just goofing around. He's goofing with us and the table next to us, it appeared to be a French general and his family. I mean, they were so staid and so buttoned down and he absolutely embodied that persona for that table as well. I was just amazed at his ability to read the table and to respond in a manner that made those people most comfortable. So there's that. And then uh, certainly one could argue, and I think this is the part where it gets a little dicey, what is the appropriate food to have with any particular wine? That's a very subjective thing. Um, so, so that part of it, I, I, I think anyone would find difficult to judge, and and I will admit that I find it difficult to, um, you know, to to give someone advice as to how to prepare for that, other than have an explanation. So, you know, it's it's all those things. Then finally, there is just the 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 pure grace at the table that that some people have and and others don't. And your and bedside you'll... manner, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I find that um, also difficult to, uh, to judge, but easy to see when it's there. Uh, sure. That's the part that's, that's quite fascinating is, is when somebody's pretty good at it, you, you struggle a little bit as to how you grade them. But when somebody's great at it, you just look back, you know, look at them and go, that was amazing. That's beautiful. Look, you know, this is amazing. I feel, you know, I, I feel like I'm watching ballet. So, you know, it's easy to see when it's great. That's fantastic. You know, and um, I think that, a, that in the past, wine has been seen as being kind of stuffy and maybe the idea of being a sommelier and knowing all these things, but it really is about opening people up to the world of wine. And by like the sommelier is the guide to the people at the table or the people in the shops or, you know, I mean, it's like your vast library of knowledge is is at the service of the people who you are speaking with. Absolutely, I, I, I do think that that's one of the critical elements uh, to judging anyone in a sommelier setting is, are they humble? Are they compassionate and giving? Are they most concerned about the customer's well-being rather than their ability to show off? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's nothing really, frankly, there's nothing ruder than someone who wants to tell you at the table how much they know when that's not really what I wanted. I wanted you to bring me a wine that I want to drink. I don't need you to tell me that this is the perfect wine and I should learn to like it, even though, though I don't want to drink that wine. You as a sommelier, and this is you know just my background, my job is to bring people the wine they want to drink, not the wine I think they should drink. So it, it's really important, uh, I think, for um, winning sommeliers to have that kind of humble, ability to to interact and connect with the people they're serving. And so why is now the right time to launch this new competition? And and why have a new competition? Um, like what what purpose is this going to serve? I think that they uh, we've needed it for a long time. So, you know, first and foremost, I should have been more proactive about this a long time ago. But there have been um, certainly our society is under enormous pressure. And, and there are a lot of questions being asked about my industry, about the wine industry and the restaurant industry that have been asked for a long time, but we're just now hearing the questions. Many of us have ignored the fact that people of color um, have been overlooked and, and shouted out, if, as it were, and certainly women have been treated the same way. The, the level of sex, sexual harassment that is endemic in the restaurant and bar trade is legendary. 
and it's 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 not a myth it's real so to me in a way it was like this is the right time for us to to launch this because we want to launch it the right way we want to launch it by focusing upon um, if you will, throwing the doors open and making sure that everyone is invited in and it doesn't become yet another white male bastion uh, of, you know, a bunch of guys, uh, you know, comparing their, their incredible breadth of knowledge uh, instead of remembering what the purpose is, which is to, to make customers feel wanted, feel taken care of, and, and therefore um, interested in wine and wanting to come back and, and do it again. So in, in looking at increasing the reach and the diversity for the people who are going to be competing, before I actually ask this full question, when is this new competition being held? Well, our intention is, and of course, COVID, the COVID era is such that, that we all have to be ready to you know, be fast on our feet. But the intention is over um, the next six months or so to provide online examinations so that people can can slowly find their way through this process. And then we'll end up with a, a, a group of uh, sommeliers who will be competing in the fall, I, ideally the first week of October, will be competing for the right to go to the Americas competition. That's to say to compete against all the sommeliers of Canada and Mexico and South America to see who will win the, the crown of top sommelier in the Americas. But also those two people will be invited to uh, the following year, uh, actually, probably it's going to be tw uh, 2023 because we're still sorting this out. However, those top two sommeliers that are chosen this fall would theoretically be the the uh, United States representative at the world competition in 2023 in, in Paris. So historically, how have the Americans stacked up? I mean, is this something where also you feel like you need to create this new organization because America kind of needs a little injection of, you know, of, of excitement. And I mean, how, how well do they do typically? The United States has never, certainly never won uh, the competition. Um, there have been US based uh, sommeliers who have done quite well, but most of them came from other countries and they were simply here for a time. The, the US has, has not placed well because we haven't really been very active in the program. And then, the, one of the great challenges has been that the, the uh, one of the purposes of this examination is that it's an international exam. Therefore, if you are a native English speaker, you must take the examination in French or Spanish. Uh, and conversely, if you're a Spanish you know, uh, speaker, then you will be taking it in French or English, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so one of the uh, struggles that uh, US-based sommeliers have had is, is that few of them are bilingual. Uh, certainly, the, the, we did have a competition in 2019. It was a, a, a smaller competition. It really was, for me, a proof of concept. I wanted to show people that we could do this. I wanted to bring in some international judges um, that would help me at, uh, make sure that we were going about this and getting started the right way. And we, we chose a gentleman named uh, Dustin Chabert, uh, who is a sommelier based in Chicago, who's American born but his, his parents are French. And so he, he did well in that examination, but I think it is still uh, one of the great challenges for us that, that we don't, our, our population is not as comfortable in other languages as, as many other uh, countries' populations are. Hmm. So other than the language barrier, um, how are United States and European sommeliers different or how are the competitions different? I think that most of all, our people just haven't seen the competitions. Uh, often not knowing what's to come means that you're sort of a deer in the headlights uh, for a lot of it. I uh, and others tried to prepare Dustin as best we could. And when, when the competition was over and he had done well, but certainly had not uh, placed in the, in the top group, we all recognized Dustin, my, uh, you know, me and everybody else who was involved, we all recognized that we had a lot to learn as, how, as to how to best prepare our people. So it's going to take a few years for sure. I don't think there's anybody uh, who has any illusions about it that, you know, in the first couple of tries that the U.S. is going to go over there and, and kick butt, but it would be pretty <laughs> cool if we did. It would be cool. Yeah. So, I mean, so how you mentioned that people will be doing these forms online. How do people actually prepare? Do they, do they have to have a certain qualification? Do they just say, I really love wine, and then they take a test, and you kind of gauge whether they're even ready to come to this 
competition? How does all of that work? Well, as a, as a group, we'll come together, um, you know, online only at this point, but www.bestusasomalia.com is where people will register and, and become members of the group, essentially, because th this group will be a democratic uh, group in which everybody who is a member can decide who the board is and decide who's in charge. It, it's very important to me that, um, that we are democratically run uh, as, as a group that we therefore will constantly be held to the standard of reflecting back to our membership, who we are as a nation, who we are as an industry. Um, having said that, so people will become members, those who are working sommeliers or at least have a history of being working sommeliers can then register to become competitors in this. And then yes, there'll be a series of online examinations. Finally, uh, they'll be sent blind wines. Um, they'll, they'll be doing a live online examination because in the COVID era, I think that's the only responsible thing to do. But our hope is that enough people will be vaccinated um, that we'll feel safer to travel. And so that a small group of folks will come to Herman, Herman, Missouri, yes. the, the, the site uh, of the, uh, the George Hussman Ranch, which most people don't realize in the 19th century, he was one of the fathers and one of the pioneers of American viticulture and American grape growing, not just in Missouri, because that's certainly where he, he this ranch is, where this uh, former brewery is, where his former uh, winery is and, and, and vineyard and house and all of that is restored. Um, he went to Napa Valley and helped create the, the modern, if you will, the, the late 19th century, eventually modern Napa wine industry as well. So we'll go to his location and we'll actually have an, a, a live exam there uh, for a live competition there for the, the, the final group of competitors. You stole my question. I was going to ask you about that because, you know, <laughs> you know, God willing that we can have the live competition in October, being able to have it in Herman, Missouri, and being able to tie in this, like you mentioned, this relatively unknown history of this, you know, this German immigrant who his, his family settled right there along the Missouri River. And um, didn't he also have an impact on the phylloxera epidemic and sending rootstocks? Yes, he really was. Um, he, he was obviously a brilliant man. And there were others involved here in, in Missouri, people like Charles Valentine Riley and, and such. Um, but he was one of that really tiny group of people who quickly recognized, here's the problem. The problem is a microscopic bug. The bug lives in America, therefore planting grapevines from Europe in America, those, those vines are gonna suffer. Well, what had happened in the 1860s is people were, trading material, plant material back and forth. And so the bug got into France. And once it got to France, it just went nuts. And it went basically into every vineyard in, in the world, but particularly every vineyard in Europe, destroying all these traditional vineyards. He surmised that uh, amongst a, a handful of other people that since it came from America, all we need to do is grow American vines but since we wanted to taste wine from European vines, we graft them together. And so he was creating grafted rootstock and creating rootstock that would survive the trip that could be grafted over in Europe and, and helped, was instrumental in sending uh, thousands of plants over to Europe so that people could rescue the, the, the European uh, vineyards. And, and to this day, I don't know a precise number, but I would say well over 90% of the world's vines are planted onto American rootstock, no matter whether we're talking about Europe or South Africa or Australia or New Zealand or wherever it is. I mean, that I think is probably mind blowing to a lot of people. And the fact that you're actually gonna be hosting this brand new sommelier competition, like in, the, in this man's home base, like on, on the ground where he planted his own vineyards and made wine with his family. I just, I think that that, I think that's extremely cool. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that you mentioned is that you've never competed. Right? <laughs> true. Now it's true. I, when I, um, I guess I would say that living in the middle of, of the country as, as I did, I mean, I'm originally from the West Coast, but we moved to the Midwest when I was a kid. And so living in Kansas City, what I knew about these competitions, what I knew about uh, 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 examinations like the Master of Wine or the Master Sommelier was only what I read in magazines. Indeed, um, what I, I tried to get involved in the Master of Wine and in the midst of getting signed up for that, 
someone told me about the math, a friend of mine who lived in California told me about the master small yay exam. And so I went and took the advanced exam with two weeks notice, <laughs> which wow. yeah, yeah, was one of those ridiculous things because I'd never heard of it. I didn't even know it existed. And he's, he's like, oh, it's in Chicago in two weeks. You should just go take, just skip the first two exams and just take the advanced exam. And I, I managed to get through, but by the skin of my teeth, I, I've no doubt about that at all. And, and the issue, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I really was ignorant of all these things. It wasn't until I'd finished those exams, the Master of Sommelier and the Master of Wine in the early 90s, that I even discovered there were these competitions. They weren't active in the United States, but I heard about them. At the same time, I was a working, you know, a working stiff on selling wine on the street. I didn't have the money to go to Europe and find out what these uh, competitions were like. So it never occurred to me until probably 10 years after I'd finished both exams, I started, you know, people started saying, well, why don't you compete? You know, you're one, of, you're one of the guys that knows all this stuff. You're ready for that. And it was like, that was 10 years ago, man. You know, <laughs> you don't have to keep taking the exam every year. You know, once you finish those things, you kind of, you know, say, hey, I'm, I've got, I got work to do now. I got to make a living. So um, unfortunately, I, I never found uh, the time never uh, really believed that it was something that I needed to do. I mean, at, at, let's face it, at the time, uh, I was one of only two people in, in the world who had both uh, titles. And it really wasn't until the third gentleman finished, which was in about the year 2000, and he started competing and winning. He was, in fact, the, the, the top winner that people started teasing me saying, well, you know, Gerard just just one top psalm of the world. Why don't you? Why don't you go? You know, keep him honest. I was like, I, I'm so not ready anymore, I, and I don't have the time to to um, to spend uh, getting ready again. Instead, I think at that point it became obvious I should help other people. That should be my task. You know, that I should see how can I help other people get prepared. How can I help other people uh, finish these exams? And and so that's what I've spent the last 25 years doing is helping people get through the MW and get through the MS. Well, and so this feels like a culmination. The best USA sommelier um, association sounds like it is the culmination of exactly that idea that what you wanted to do was to assist others and to uplift them. And um, and so we're going to have a follow up uh, conversation. Like I know that you're right at the very beginning. You know, you've just announced this. So we'll check in in a couple of months and, and kind of see where everything stands. But. I thought it was really interesting that you, when we first started talking, you you mentioned that um, bringing more people into the conversation about wine was one of the driving factors behind this. And I thought it was also quite interesting that you just mentioned that the reason why you never competed was because you living in Kansas City just were not even aware. And I think that 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 it's really interesting that you're really, truly your personal experience, it sounds like is leading to um, an understanding that you have to broaden the opportunity for people because a lot of folks probably just don't even know. They might have this kind of like latent idea of, oh, it would be really, you know, it'd be really cool to be able to do X, Y, and Z, but I have no idea how to even get started. So, um, so, so before we sign off, kind of like go through just the basics with me. How can people get involved? Um, what are the steps? How, what do people need to know in order to, uh, like what background do they have to have in order to join the organization? Are there any limitations? Kind of give me, give me the, the, the details on that so people have that information. Sure. Well, certainly we're, uh, oh, you know, the doors are open to anybody and, and we appreciate anybody who wants to become a member. Essentially, we've created four categories of, of members. Certainly the sommelier members are, are those who are going to be voting and able to decide where the organization goes. But in, indeed, the wine trade, uh, the industry itself is welcome to join, even if unless they have or have been or, or are sommeliers, they won't have a voting role, but they can still um, certainly join as well consumers. Uh, we have a category just of, of friends of, of the organization. I will if, join if they, that. Well, I, <laughs> kind of in the industry too, aren't you? So <laughs> I think so. And and then of course, you know, institutional or corporate uh, entities are, are welcome to join again, but aren't allowed to have a voting role because to us, it's very important that this is 
uh, constantly, that we are constantly reminded that we're responsible to the sommelier community, that that's who we ought to be talking to. And, and so our hope and, and goal certainly is to, to create a fund so that we can provide scholarships to people who will need it, um, whether it is to learn more about this process or to go and compete when we, when we choose our, our, um, our, our top candidates. All of that is very important. So we will, uh, you know, the website, www.bestusasommelier.com uh, uh, is what it is. And uh, that's where people can go and, and register to become members uh, or just to find out more about it. So um, it's our hope that we can grow a robust community and, and really, as I say, be tested uh, and, and our feet, you know, have our feet held to the fire that we really will find ways to involve people of color and to be more respectful to, towards women and all of this. I mean, it's time for the industry to grow up and to be responsible. And I think that because we're starting out now, we have a chance to start from a clean slate and do it right from the beginning. So that would be, that would be our principal goal. I am so thrilled that you took some time out of your schedule to talk with me about this, Doug. And um, like I've met, like I said, Doug and I have known each other for for years now. And um, being such an accomplished wine professional, you know, you you are a person who is perfectly suited. And being located right in the middle of the country, you're also pr perfectly um, uh, positioned to kind of pull more people into the conversation about wine and to make it a much more democratic, small d. Um, uh, you know, uh, experience for people because wine at its heart, it's delicious. Wine enhances life, it enhances food. And the more that you know about wine and can choose wines that you love, it kind of like can open you up to so many experiences. So when you walk into the wine shop, even just as a consumer, when you sit down and, you know, at a, and order wine at, at a restaurant, or if you walk in to, to pick up a bottle of wine for dinner, just having even that bit of knowledge is critical. And the fact that you are, um, are really working to deepen and broaden the, um, the diversity and the kind of the openness of the American wine professionals is just gonna make it that much better for consumers. So I think cheers to you. Well, thank you, that's very kind. And, and yeah, that's definitely our goal. So um, we should be held to that. Fantastic. Okay, one more time on the URL. So it's www.bestusasommelier.com. Perfect. All right. So Doug and I will catch up in a couple of months as he is getting closer to the competition in October in Herman, Missouri. Thank you so much, Doug. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kat. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. We'll be in touch soon.